Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so, um, so this talk will be about creating big dynamic distributed data. And it's certainly going to be about streams, but streams in sort of a different context than the one we've seen so far. Uh, so streams in a distributed system. And uh, this is going to be, uh, this talk will be about work that we've done in the context of the LIFT uh, project. Uh, so LIFT stands for uh, Local Inference in Massively Distributed Systems. Uh, and it's a FET open project that's actually winding down uh, at the end of this year. Uh, and of course, you know, a lot of the things I'll talk about are not just my work, but also work done by a cast of folks. And I'm just some, you know, giving you some, some, some important names here. OK, so um, you know, again, I, I don't, I'll go over these uh, first slides uh, very quickly. I don't think I need to convince you that uh, you know, big data is big news and big business. It's hit the popular press. Uh, you know, everybody is talking about big data and the idea that you know we're really gathering so much data with all these new information gathering technologies. And of course, this raises a lot of questions about how to effectively manage and analyze all this data, right? And so, when you hear about you know the challenges that uh, big data uh, imposes, you know you hear you often hear about these four V's. And uh, uh, you know, uh, I think all of the almost all of the talks that we've seen in this uh, uh, meeting have actually. Uh, touched upon some of these Vs. Okay, so the four Vs. First of all, volume. Okay? So scaling from from uh, terabytes to going going to exabytes or zettabytes. Uh, okay, so we're going to uh, really closing in on the exabyte era, and I think the zettabyte era is not that far. Uh, the second V is velocity. You know, processing. So big data is rarely going to be static. You know, just sitting there in some database allowing us to do multiple passes. So big data is dynamic, which means that we really need to deal with massive amounts of streaming data. Uh, the third V is variety. And you know, I think a lot of talks touched upon this. Gerhard's talk, uh, Surajit's talk. You know, uh, we really cannot assume that our data is just very nicely structured, lying in some relational database. We need to deal with many, many different types of data uh, with varying levels of structure in the data, ranging from text to fully structured relational data. And something that wasn't mentioned so much, but I think certainly Gerhard's talk uh, um, touched upon was, was this issue of veracity. Okay, so veracity basically means that when you have big data, you're going to have inevitably a lot of noise. So you need techniques that are able to deal with you know, the noise and the uncertainty that lies in the data. Okay, so if, when you do information extraction, that's an inherently uncertain process. You know, entity matching, you know. Uh, obviously, you need to, some effective way of dealing with this uncertainty. Now, along with these four Vs, I would like to propose a, a, another dimension, a fifth dimension that I think is very important and is often overlooked. And that's the dimension of distribution. Um, so big data is rarely going to be static. It's very often going to be actually distributed in widely distributed systems, so, you know, many, many data centers possibly around the world. And it's going to be, in many situations, going to be impossible uh, due to communication constraints or to other constraints, like administrative constraints or privacy constraints, to so actually centralize all this data in a single data center. Okay? So you somehow need to deal with the distributed nature of big data as well. Okay? And basically, this is exactly what the Lyft uh, project is all about. It's basically focusing on the volume, velocity, and distribution. Okay? So basically, we want to deal with massive distributed data streams, effectively. Okay. So streams, I, I guess, again, I don't need to give you too much context here. I think the, the basic idea is you, know, you have all these um, uh, new technologies that you know, co continuously generate data, and you need to sort of have continuous queries over this data that continuously monitor the incoming streams for different patterns or, or events of interest. Okay? So this sort of continuous querying of streams is sort of a well-known paradigm. And the way that this is modeled typically in sort of the, stream, uh, the streaming algorithmics world is, is something, looks at something like this. So you have sort of this a stream processing engine over here that's observing these continuous data streams, which can be, you know, petabytes or exabytes of data. And of course, you cannot afford to store all this data. So what you do is you build these stream synopsis that you keep in memory, which are orders of magnitude smaller than your original streams. And then when a query comes in or a function that you want to compute over the stream, basically what you do is you go to the synopsis and you give an approximate answer, hopefully with some guarantees on the approximation error. Okay? And of course, 
uh, as Surajit also mentioned this morning, you know, approximate answers are often sufficient for many of these problems. When you're looking for elephants, when you're looking for trends, anomalies, you're right? You don't really need answers that are precise to the last decimal, okay? So clearly, a lot of the smarts here needs, has concentrated on building these stream synopsis. And the, the problem here is building this synopsis, you know, module, uh, uh, given all the constraints that you have in the streaming model. So this means that basically you need synopsis that work in a single pass, so you have to build these summaries you know, with one pass over the data. You cannot go back and forth. Uh, you need synopsis that are small space, so orders of magnitude smaller than the streams. Typically, your space requirements need to be logarithmic or polylogarithmic in the stream size. Uh, they need to be, uh, in addition to small space, you also need small time. Okay? When the stream is really rapid, you really want to be able to update this synopsis very quickly. So the per-record processing time has to be very low. Okay? And another thing that's also very important is to, to have these structures that are delete proof. Uh, basically, you need, so in the very generic stream model, you can have not only appends and inserts, you can also have deletes. Okay, so you need synopsis that can gracefully deal with deletes in the stream. And so, something that's also very important, and you know, that's something that also the, the next uh, talk will focus on, is this idea of mergeability or composability. And this is very important where you apply these streams as sort of a distributed system, that you can build these synopsis um, uh, this synopsis in an independent way in, uh, in different sides of your system and then at the end of the day put them together and get a global view of the overall stream, okay? Okay, so <coughs> just, just to make sure that we understand what I'm talking about, uh, you know, when we talk about a stream, so the model that I'm assuming is basically a relational stream is basically just a very, very long dynamic array, okay? And you can think of this array essentially as the frequency distribution vector of, you know, your relation, your favorite relation. And of course, the relation doesn't have to be uh, one-dimensional. It can be multi-dimensional, but you just need some way of sort of unfolding the dimensions on the line, you know, row major, column major, pick your favorite. But the basic idea now is that you have this very, very long frequency distribution vector, and basically when you have inserts and deletes, the components of the vector, which are the counts for a given double combination, are going up and down, okay? Uh, so basically, the, you're, you're basically observing this very, very long signal that's implicitly rendered through a stream of updates. And an update basically says, you know, go to location X of my array and add C to it. Okay? So X is basically the combination of attributes for, a, for the incoming tuple, so w which basically is the index in this array, and C is basically the insert or delete. So if I have an insert, it's a plus one. If I have a delete, it's a minus one. Or you can have bulk inserts and deletes. So this is basically a relational stream, right? It's a very, very, very long vector with dynamic components. Okay, that component is going up and down. And what's the goal of these all these streaming algorithms? Our goal is to basically compute queries or functions over this very long vector using space and time that is much, much smaller than n. Okay, so how can we compute interesting functions, interesting queries over this vector using space and time that's much smaller than that required by the entire vector? So a lot of work has concentrated on this, on this model, sort of the previous model that I, I talked about. Well, now what I will argue is that, you know, really this, this model is not, this sort of centralized model is not very sufficient, okay? Because basically in many, many uh, stream processing applications, so for instance, the, these large-scale event monitoring applications that everybody is talking about, like sensor net monitoring or power grid monitoring and so on, you rarely get this sort of complete vision of the entire stream. Okay, so typically what you have is, is something that looks like this. Okay, so you have these sites that are sort of, can be distributed in the wide area, and each one of these sites can actually be observing its own local stream. So think of these as sort of the monitors that you've incorporated in your network monitoring infrastructure, and the coordinator is basically the NOC, the network operation center, that's trying to figure out what's going on in the network. Okay, so basically each one of these M sites is observing its own local rapid, massive volume data stream, and the coordinator wants to monitor a function or a query over the union of all these streams, okay? So clearly, this is a very simplistic structure. You can have sort of a multi-level hierarchy. You can have a sort of a peer-to-peer -peer network or, you know, your favorite uh, distributed architecture, but for the time being, let's just concentrate on this, okay? So our goal is to continuously track a global query over the union of the streams observed at the sites, and as you can see, here we're introducing an additional dimension. So there's always the naive solution that says, you know, I'm just going to push all the data up to the coordinator and turn this into a centralized problem. But we really want to avoid that because 
of all the issues that I mentioned. So really, you know, in the early slides, right? So you really want a distributed solution that doesn't really need, want to centralize all the data, centralize the streaming data all the time because of data volume, because of various constraints and so on. So compared to the earlier model, now we introduce an additional, uh, an additional constraint, which is basically that of communication. So we really want solutions that are not only space and time efficient, but they're also, they also need to be communication efficient. Okay? So in this distributed streaming context, communication starts playing a major role. Okay? And what are examples of queries that we might want to monitor over the setup? Things like, for instance, join aggregates, variance, entropy, uh, you know, complex functions over these uni the union of all these streams. Okay? So this is basically our go going to be our setup. Okay? Uh, and if you think about it, it seems very hard to really say anything interesting. Right? So if I want to, to really track the value of the function continuously, as the streams are continuously changing, it seems that the only way I, I, want to, I can do this is basically by pushing all the data up to the coordinator. Okay? Well, if you sort of monitor the class of problems that you're, you're focusing on, it turns out that you can be much smarter. And basically, that's what we'll do. So we'll focus on two classes of monitoring problems. First of all, what we call a threshold crossing problem. So we're not, here we're not interested in knowing exactly the value of the function. We just want to know whether that function has actually crossed a certain threshold. Okay, and we want to generate an alarm when that happens. Okay? And a second and more general setup is basically we don't care about the exact value of the function. We instead care about you know, the value of the function within some guaranteed accuracy bound epsilon. So we don't care about knowing the exact value of f at all, all times. We just want to know that it's within some, a certain error bound. Okay? And th then that gives us the opportunity to basically trade off accuracy and communication and processing cost. Okay. So clearly, the naive solution is centralize all the data, but this is something that we really want to avoid. You know, we don't want to centralize the data and apply the known streaming algorithms. Instead, what we want to do is want to design solutions that sort of process the data at the edge. Right? So we want to process as much as we can at the edge. What we do is this, this idea of sort of in situ stream processing. And the basic idea is we take this global query and we try to sort of push it down to local constraints, to safe local constraints that we can install at the sites. Okay, so this is the basic idea. Um, so you basically, you know, take your global query, you try to sort of map it into safe local constraints. Safe meaning that, you know, as long as none of the sites speak up, then you're, you're guaranteed to be safe. You haven't crossed that threshold, right? So, uh, and when something happens, something bad happens, then you need to push information to the coordinator. Okay, so this is a very simple sort of pictorial representation. So you somehow build these local constraints or filters that you push down to the sites. And then as long as the readings that you see here are within your filters, you don't need to do anything. But then once you get sort of a, an outlier reading, then you need to push that information to the coordinator. And then the coordinator may come back and say, you know, you need to adjust your filters to make sure that the system again operates within the desirable range and do something like that, okay? So again, this is a very, very simple view. And, uh, uh, and as you can imagine, you know, the, the smarts here comes into how do you build these filters, okay? And there are situations where that are very simple. And the simpler situations are, of course, when this f function is linear. So if your f function is linear, like a sum or, you know, an average, right? Then things become easy because what you can do is you can get some slack with respect to the threshold, for instance. And you can sort of distribute that slack across the sites. And you're, you know, as long as you're within your slack, you're fine. The problem is what happens when you, so, so linearity means additivity. Additivity means that we're able to basically get these filters very easily. The problem now is what happens when you have complex functions that are not necessarily linear. How can we generate these filters in an effective way? And this is something that I'll try to cover today. And just to give you a sense of where we are and where we're going, so basically I've sort of tried to introduce this continuous distributed streaming model that. Uh, uh, you know, I present in the earlier slides. And now I'm going to talk about the geometric method, which is a, a very generic method for coming up with these local constraints for general functions, okay? Not, not necessarily linear for any, any type of function, okay? Uh, then I will discuss some recent work that actually combines the geometric method with sketch summaries. And in the end, if I have enough time, I'll try to go over some challenges and conclude, and, uh, uh, that I see in this area and conclude the talk. If you have any questions, you know, please feel free to raise your hand. Okay, so the problem we're gonna focus on just to begin with is basically we want to figure out whether a, a non, 
linear function or query over a union of distributed streams. So each one of these streams is basically, you can think of it as a sort of a dynamic vector, as we discussed, right? So you have a function over all these vectors, and we want to figure out whether that function actually crosses a certain threshold, OK? If the function is nonlinear, as I said, so you can imagine something like information gain, for instance, right? Then, you know, coming up with these local filters is a non-trivial problem. And actually, uh, it's not difficult to see that, you know, if you have a complex enough function, uh, you can have situations where, you know, even though globally the function may have crossed the threshold, the local values of the function can actually be anywhere, you know, below the threshold, above the threshold, whatever you want, okay? So, and this is just a very simple example, okay? So how do you get these safe local constraints when your function is, is nonlinear? So this is basically what the, the heart of the geometric method. Okay. So let's, let's go over the basic ideas. So this was actually uh, work that was done by uh, uh, some partners in the project you know, a few years back in Sigma 2006. And the basic idea of the method is since we want to be completely agnostic about the function that we're monitoring, we are not going to monitor the domain of the, the range of the function. So we don't care about the values of the function. We're actually going to monitor the domain. Okay? We're actually going to monitor the domain of the function, so where the function is defined, these streaming vectors, rather than the range of values of the function. Okay? So this is going to be the basic idea. So let's try to sort of formalize the problem a bit. First of all, we assume each site is tracking a local statistics vector. So each site has this sort of dynamic local statistics vector. This is the local data stream that it's monitoring. So the local frequency distribution, if you want. Okay? So site i is tracking this local statistics vector vi. And the global statistics vector, so the global stream, we're going to define it as a convex combination of the local statistics vectors. Okay? So for instance, the global stream, we're going to say it's going to be an average of the local data streams. Okay? And this is like a vector average. right? So this is, again, a vector. A long vector. Okay. okay, so this is basically the problem we're trying to solve. The global stream is this convex combination of the local streaming vectors. And the condition we want to monitor is whether the value of a function over v goes beyond a certain threshold. Okay. First of all, let's assume that you know, we've, we've done a sync. We've done an initial sync. So the coordinator now has an estimate of the local of every local statistics vector, OK? And at any point in time, the coordinator will have an estimate based on the updates that it's received from the site. And let's say that the latest update that the coordinator has received from site i is this vi prime, OK? So this is the latest update I've seen from site i. Uh, I. And I have an estimate at this point, based on the updates I've seen, I'm the coordinator, I have this estimate e, which is basically the convex combination of all these vi primes, OK? So this is my view, my current view as a coordinator of what's going on in the system. Of course, you know, by the time when I have received VI prime, that was sometime in the past, of course, you know, the site may have drifted, right? So after it sent me this VI prime update, it may have drifted by some delta VI. So again, this is a vector that basically tells me how much site I has drifted from the latest update that it sent me, okay? And of course, I don't know delta VI as a coordinator, but the site knows that, okay? Okay, so... The key observation here is that if I look at the current global vector, so this is the current global picture of the stream, okay, it's always going to be a convex combination of these translated local drifts, where basically I take these local drifts, these delta vi's, so how much each, each site has drifted, and I translate it by the current estimate, this e. Okay? So just to sort of give you a picture of what this looks like, let's say that we have two dimensions in, in our vectors, OK? And we have one, two, three, four, five sites, OK? And this is the previous estimate. And these are the drifts in two-dimensional space. So this is, basically, this is basically how far site one has drifted from the latest update, site two, and so on, OK? What does this tell me? It basically tells me that even though you know, I may not know exactly where V is, I know that it's always going to be, since it's a convex combination of these translated local drifts, I know that it's always going to be somewhere within this convex hull. Okay? So the basic idea would be to try to monitor what's going on in this convex hull, and whether some point in this convex hull has actually, you know, gone beyond the threshold. Okay? 
the, the function value of some point in this convex hull. Well, the question is, how does this help me? Because if I, if I need to build this convex hull, then I actually need to collect the delta vi's, then I actually need to know exactly the drifts, and I know the global vector. The question is, can I, can, can I get sort of a, 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 a way to, to cover this convex hull using just local constraints? And the, the answer is yes. So basically what, we, what they showed was that in any dimensionality, if I take <laughs> the union of these spheres that I basically center around these translated local drifts, okay? So basically what I do is I, I, I take these local drift vectors and I design a sphere around each one, okay? Then you can show that in any dimensionality, the union of all these balls, the union of all these spheres will always cover the convex hull, okay? And of course, you know, these, these spheres are gonna be centered in the middle of this uh, vector and can have radius half basically the length of the vector, okay? And why is this important? Because these spheres are now completely local, okay? So basically what you can do, every site can actually build its sphere completely locally and can check that sphere completely locally. And we know that, you know, as long as none of the sites speaks up, the convex hull is safe. So that's the basic idea, okay? Now just to formalize this a little more, um, so basically what we can do is we can view the sort of this threshold crossing problem as sort of a, a coloring problem of the domain plane, okay? So let's say that we have, you know, basically the, the, our, our threshold crossing problem is we want to check whether f of x grows beyond a certain tau, okay? We can view this basically as a coloring of the space where you have this inadmissible region here, this, this red region, and the rest of the region is safe. So as long as, as my V stays within the, the rest of the region, everything is good. And of course, this admissible, it, this inadmissible region can actually be very complex. You can have holes, you can, depending on the value F, the function F that you use, it can be arbitrarily complex, okay? So the basic thing that we wanna do here is we wanna check whether the convex hull is monochromatic, whether it stays on the right side of the constraint, okay? So, how do we check that? We basically check whether each sphere is, mo is monochromatic, okay? So each site will basically build its own sphere based on its local drift, okay? And will independently check the monochromicity of its own sphere, okay? And if none of the sites speak up, then we know we're safe and we can continue. How do you check the monochromicity? Basically, what you need to do is solve an optimization problem within that sphere. So essentially what you're doing, is you're, again, you're gonna have more processing done at the edge, right, to check these local constraints. But basically what you need to do is, within your sphere, you need to check the maximum and minimum value of the F function. So you solve a constraint optimization problem within its sphere. And as long as both these values are on the right side of the constraint, you're fine, okay? And so this is the ba gonna be the basic idea. Of course, in certain situations, what will happen is, you know, you can have some sphere sort of piercing into the inadmissible region. So at this point, what will happen is, site three is gonna speak up because its sphere is no longer more chromatic. And when it speaks up, it's gonna send it delta V up to the coordinator. It's delta V now becomes zero, so by definition, its sphere is monochromatic, right? But by sending the new delta V, your E may have changed, so things may move around. So in the worst case, what will happen is every side will speak up, all the del delta Vs will become zero, and you just get a current reference point which is by definition monochromatic. So the convex hull which is gonna be reduced to a single point, okay? Okay, so, of course, you can play a lot of games here in terms of the resolution protocol. So if you have a local violation, how do you resolve it? How do you pick sites trying to balance each other out and so on? There are several different games you can play. You can allocate slacks to different sites to try to minimize these sort of local balancing operations. But I'm not gonna go into the details here, but hopefully you get the, the basic idea. Uh, and uh, just to uh, drive the point further, uh, you know, the, there was some more recent work that actually showed that you can actually generalize this idea. You can uh, use el ellipsoids instead of spheres, try to take better advantage of the flexibility that the, el the ellipsoid regions give you. Uh, you can actually use any point to design these ellipsoids other than E. You can actually have a reference point that you can push away from the boundary. So if you're close to the boundary, you don't need to design your spheres or your ellipsoids around E, you can actually push your E away from the boundary and get a reference point that's far, and the covering theorem still holds, okay? And in general, there's a more, it turns out that this is actually a more general theory uh, behind this idea. So this is just a very special uh, 
uh, a special uh, implementation of this safe zone idea, where a safe zone can be in general defined as a convex uh, sub, sub region of the admissible region. I'm not going to go into these details here because I, I, I want to move on to the next part, which is actually the more recent work that we've done uh, that talks about how you take this geometric monitoring idea and combine it with sketches. Okay? Okay. Uh, Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to be a, a, a little quick here. Uh, I think, uh, but the basic idea is this. So so far, the method basically assumes that these local data streams are complete, right? So I, I maintain the full vectors locally. Well, if you have really massive data streams, you really cannot afford to do that, and you have to use some kind of summarization and sketching at the edge. Okay, uh, of course. Uh, and in addition, what we want to do is we don't want to we don't care about just threshold crossing, but we want to monitor the value of a function approximately. Now. Obviously, you know, monitoring the value of a function, you can map it into these sort of pair, paired threshold crossing problems, right? So you can, that's not difficult to do, but you need to account for the errors uh, as well as the sketching errors. So, so if you summarize the streams, you also need to sort of account for the sketching errors, okay? Um, so the key problems that we came up, that we have to deal with in this context is first of all, trying to minimize the data exchange volume when you're using these sketches, because sketches are of course summaries, but they can still get pretty large. And secondly, how do you deal with the nonlinear nature of the AMS estimator? Okay? And just to give you a sense of, 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 of what the functions we're trying to compute are, they look something like this. It's sort of a generalization of the frequency moment idea that has been repeated again and again. So let's say that we have you know, two different data streams that are distributed across perhaps different sets of sites. And we want to monitor the, uh, the size of the inner product of these two frequency distribution vectors, which is basically the size of the equijoin of the two. Okay? And this is a very generic query class because it captures things like even ranges. You can do heavy hitters, you can do wavelets, you can do all, the, all different types of things, range queries, range aggregates, and so on. Okay? And the way we do this typically in the streaming world is using this idea of sort of randomized linear projections, which are basically these AMS sketches. So what you do is you take this very long vector and you take inner products of that vector with uh, random variates. And so you get you know, the first random projection x1. You can repeat this with many different families. And you get in, eventually what you get is the sketch, which is basically a much shorter vector that contains random projection, random linear projections of the original vector. Okay? The nice thing about all these summaries is that they're linear, very easy to compute over a stream. You can very easily compose them, so they're mergeable. You can do just addition and, and get the picture of the whole stream. And based on that, you can also compute things like joins. Okay? So here what I'm showing you is the estimator, the AMS estimator function for the self-join, the special case where you just have one stream and you want to estimate the self-join, which is basically the L2 norm squared, right? F2, uh, F2 norm squared. Okay? So what do you do here? You basically look at your sketch as a two-dimensional matrix, and uh, you have one over epsilon square copies of the sketch in this, in this direction here. So you have uh, rows that have size one over epsilon square, and you have a log one over delta such rows. And what you do is, over each row, you square the random projection, and you take the average, and then you get log one over delta averages, and after all, what you do is you take the median. Right? So this is basically what this this function is saying, right? So the final estimation I'm gonna get for the F2 squared, right? The L2 uh, squared norm for this, for the, or the self-joint size, is basically gonna be the median of a bunch of row averages sketch. And this turns out to be a very, very good estimate, okay? So if you think about it, this is basically the function that we wanna monitor, right? So what we want is, you know, if we want to monitor the self-joint over a distributed stream, this is basically the function. Right? So your, 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 your uh, local statistics vector is going to be your local sketch. And this is the function that you want to try to monitor to see whether your function has crossed a certain threshold or is within certain bound. Okay? And it turns out not to be such a trivial problem. First off, as I said, these sketches can get large. So, and especially what happens is that these matrices get, you know, they're short and they're very, very fat. Right? So this 1 over epsilon square can actually get very large if you really want tight error guarantees. Whereas, you know, the log one over delta, because of the log there, is actually pretty small, right? So this one over epsilon square causes a lot of problems, and these sketches can get very large, which means, of course, a lot of communication, okay? So what we showed in this paper, which, again, hopefully will appear in, in, in BLDB 2013, uh, it's 
you know, it's undergoing the last round of revision, so hopefully if everything goes well, it will appear in BLDB this year. We actually showed that you can actually reduce this problem to just looking at the log one over delta dimensions that correspond to the norms of the rows of the sketch matrix, okay? So if you define this row norm, if you define this row norm error vector, this di error vector over here, you can actually show that the AMS estimator can be bounded by functions of this di vector. And the nice thing is that this di vector just has O log one over delta dimensions. So basically we're just monitoring the log one over delta dimensional space, which is much, much cheaper, okay? A second technical component, a second technical difficulty is dealing with the median uh, operator. So the median operator is a, is a highly nonlinear function and we need to somehow effectively deal with that. And the problem here is, remember we have this optimization problem to solve within every ball that we get. And actually what we show in the paper is that there's actually a different way of thinking about the problem where uh, you can use a greedy algorithm to actually get the distance of the ball center to the inadmissible region, to the closest point in the inadmissible region, which basically allows you to tell whether your ball is monochromatic or not, okay? Uh, and there's a fast greedy algorithm that allows you to do that. So it's not even that computation intensive. Okay, uh, now of course taking this idea and extending it to uh, non-self joints, like general joints, is, uh, can be done. It's non-trivial, but it can be done, and we show how it can be done. And we actually compared this technique against uh, the work that we had earlier with Graham a few years back, showing how to, to use AMS sketches for monitoring such functions, which was a, a very purpose-specific solution for these types of queries. Uh, and not as general as the geometric method. And we actually show that the geometric method is much smarter. It actually uh, beats, the, beats our earlier algorithm. Uh, and it beats it by a lot if you don't consider, if you have a broadcast channel at the coordinator, which allows you to do control of the remote sites more effectively. Um, so um, for the last part, I had uh, planned to talk about some challenges. I'm not going to go over them. I just want to say that you know, this, this continuous distributed monitoring uh, area is really picking up some steam over the past few years. And uh, you know, there's a bunch of people who have worked on different problems in this continuous distributed streaming model. Uh, people around this room like Kevin and, and Graham and, and Milan and others. Uh, and there was uh, a, a recent workshop about a year and a half ago in uh, Nishonan, Japan, that talked about exactly some of these issues. And a lot of the attendants here were also in that workshop. So that's good to see that you know, the, the, there's some continuation of interest in this area. And, you know, again, there's many challenges, like, you know, going to peer-to-peer -peer systems. If you go into a peer-to-peer -peer network, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a really hard problem. Because there you don't have a notion of a coordinator. So you need some other way of sort of communicating the information around. What does it mean for the system to stabilize and so on? Um, there's also problems in terms of applying the theory to systems, theoretical foundations. Uh, I mean, talked about lower bounds as sort of a traditional streaming model. But this, in, in this continuous distributed streaming model, this is sort of a completely new thing. Uh, uh, so communication complexity applies to just sort of, sort of one-shot computations, uh, uh, but for, uh, for these sort of distributed computation problems. But you know, if you have continuous distributed computation, it's not clear how exactly uh, to prove lower bounds here. But certain lower bounds have been proven. But it seems like there should be a, a more foundational theory behind all this. Um, and in general, again, uh, you know, we've, this is the basic idea. So we've talked about you know, uh, the geometric method as a generic tool for dealing with these continuous distributed streaming problems. Uh, actually, the, the method is very powerful. So we can, we've, I've shown you a sort of a summary of how to combine it with sketches. We had some work in Sigma last year that talked about how to combine dynamic prediction models with the geometric method. And some more recent work that actually shows how to apply the geometric method for even more complex functions, things like you know, monitoring a distributed skyline over a set of streams. Um, there's a lot of interesting work that remains to be done, and I just want to sort of plug in here uh, this workshop that we're organizing in, uh, in, in BLDB this year, uh, which is exactly on big dynamic distributed data. Uh, and you know, the, the deadline here there is May 29th, but I have uh, from good sources that it's going to get extended. So if you have something that you, you want to send, you know, please consider uh, submitting it. Uh, I think it's going to be a really exciting workshop. And, uh, we, we, we hopefully we'll get some, some submissions from this room as well. And with that, you know, I just want to thank you all. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the Lyft website where you can actually get some more information about the project and, and papers, presentations, and so on. And my webpage, of course, feel free to contact me for anything. <laughs>